welcome to the Our World Heritage 2021 debate. 2021 debate is a year of events focused on protection, conservation and management of world heritage. We want to uncover untold stories to broaden our views on heritage practices and future perspectives. Knowledge gathered this year will be published in 2022 on the occasion of the 50th anniversary of the Convention. The Our World Heritage Initiative is created by individuals working on 100% voluntary capacity. We would like to point out that Our World Heritage provides an open dialogue platform that is based on voluntary work of session organizers and speakers. Our World Heritage welcomes diverse viewpoints in the spirit of collegial debate where mutual respect is afforded to all. Please note that the expressed views do not necessarily reflect the official position of Our World Heritage. We thank today's speakers for telling their stories and we thank you, the listeners, for your kind interests and questions. If you want to remain up to date on our activities, you can follow our social media. We maintain channels in multiple languages to break through the language barriers and connect to local communities. You will find all links on our website, ourworldheritage.org. Thank you for being with us today and we wish you a very fruitful event. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. I'm happy to see some of you joining us from different parts of the world. Welcome to our World Heritage 2021 debate. Our thematic group covers one of the 12 themes of the debate during September, which is heritage sites and memory. I'm Dr. Hiba Al Khalaf, co-organizer and a moderator for the, web for the webinar today. I'm a researcher at King's College London, the Department of Classics. On behalf of the team, please allow me to welcome you today. This webinar is the first session of the September theme and will focus today on changing meaning of heritage places. And as you can see that the, the main idea behind this webinar that heritage is a very complex term that embraces a huge range of tangible and intangible values and its unique character and sense of place. So the values that people assign to places are not static they change over time, either gradually following socioeconomic changes, change of interpretations, or rapidly because of conflict, war, or natural disasters. The process, however, of assessing the values follows an inter international system as well as local. For instance, World Heritage Sites, either cultural or natural, have their uh, outstanding universal value that may not necessarily match the meanings and values that local people assign to their heritage. However, changing meanings has an impact on the integrity, authenticity, management of heritage. The plurality of place meaning requires employing various methods and tools for mapping and interpreting these meanings, such as community consultation, stakeholders workshop, digital tools, crowdsourcing, social media, or etc. Our invited speakers for today will present various case studies. Um, next slide, please. Uh, we'll present various case studies from across the globe. As we can see, these cases had experienced change of meanings following various reasons, such as conflict in the ancient city of Aleppo, Syria, or in Penaluca in Bosnia and Herzegovina, or a change of interpretations and value to a heritage place, such as in uh, Beit Yekan in historic Cairo in Egypt, or socioeconomic changes that had impacted the traditional architectural system in Takicheo, Miyazaki, Japan. Today, our speaker will also address using digital platforms to engage communities with their heritage and allow assessing and documenting both tangible and intangible heritage such as, such as the cases from East London, the Caribbean, and also the case of uh, Gina Kanda and Mali. Next slide, please. Uh, 
uh, here is the speakers for today. Uh, we welcome all of you. Uh, thank you for your time. So we're going to start uh, with our speaker, Dr. Um, uh, Ali uh, Smaid, the CEO of Aga Khan Trust for Culture. Uh, Dr. Ali will take us in a journey of complete reconstruction of Aleppo. Aleppo is the city that has witnessed a large scale of destruction, destruction during the, the conflict, particularly during 2012 and 2016. Since then, the rehabilitation and rebuilding in Aleppo has started focusing mainly on marketplaces. They are funded and implement, implemented by Aga Khan Development Network, and the project of Suku Sakatiya was the pioneering reconstruction project. Dr. Ali, you may have the floor. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the kind invitation. I really appreciate uh, uh, the effort. And uh, of course, we are here to share some of our untold stories yet about what the work that we have been doing for the past couple of years. And if you allow me, just because we have a very tight schedule, just to go directly to the presentation that we have prepared so that I hope by the end of the presentation, you will be able just to have an understanding about what we're talking about. So. Just... Yes, please. Thank you. Okay. So basically, when we are talking about uh, heritage, it's something that over a lot of diversity and complexity, especially in a country like Syria, where everybody is actually aware of what's happened or what has been there for the past uh, almost a decade now. Um, going out uh, of this dilemma is not something easy, because if you look, actually, we are dealing here with uh, one of the oldest, if not the oldest, continuously inhabited city in the world, Aleppo. It comes first before Jericho, uh, older than Jericho, with almost 1,700 years, and 3,000 years older than Damascus, which is the oldest continuously inhabited uh, capital in the world. So when we have been invited as the Aga Khan Trust for Culture to come actually and see what could be done in the city that we have worked previously between the years 2000 until 2010, uh, we were basically mesmerized. We were uh, astonished. We were uh, dazzled with the level of destruction that we have seen for the first time. Um, of course, when we are talking about Aleppo, it's actually the city on the northern of the country, uh, very close to the Turkish border, not so far from uh, the Mediterranean coast. And not to forget that Aleppo used to be one of the central nodes, important one city. Uh, at the Silk Road. Now, as I said, when we have been invited or asked to come to help, the first thing is actually is to have a better understanding about what could be done, is to look to the damage map of the old city of Urbana. The total area of the old city is approximately 16 hectares or 1.6 square kilometers. Uh, we are talking about a diversity of ethnic groups, communities, a lot of activities taking place there. So it's not only residential versus commercial, it's a mixture of everything, just like any other old city. Just by looking to the map, you will have a better understanding about the percentage of the damage that we were talking about. In the center of the old city, of course, we are talking about the citadel, which is the main landmark. Uh, and uh, of course, every uh, corner, which is close to the citadel, you can see that the color red is becoming darker, which means that more intense damage in that area. Just to give you a better understanding about the level of damage, this is actually an aerial photo very close to the citadel. And you can see what kind of damage that we are talking about that when we came first in 2017. Um, of course, when we first came, it was a huge task. Where to start? That's the big question. And what to do? That's the other most important question. And are we able to meet the expectation? That's also something very important. And to start with, we tried actually to have a better understanding about well, what's the level of damage that we are talking about. Can we take a sample and make this sample as generic as possible? And we were actually discussing what are the most important landmarks in the whole city. Area one is 
the big mosque and the surrounding bazaars. Area two is actually where the citadel is. And area three is the famous residential area. And we were discussing whether we should take a one or two or three as a sample for a damage assessment. And how we can start actually damage assessment. Is it possible to do it with the traditional method by sending actually trained groups to the ground to do it? It wasn't possible because after a decade of war, first, where are those actually trained groups of individuals who can do a damage assessment? Are they available? Yes or no? The answer was definitely no. The resources, whether that's technical, human resources, financial, also is not available. So the answer with the technology, and we started using the top-notch drone technology in order to have a better uh, understanding in a very short period of time. Here is an example of how we actually were able using the drone, where every red dot is where the drone stopped to take a picture. And this is actually an example site for the Umayyad Mosque. And you can imagine how many hundreds of thousands of pictures that we have for the old city of Aleppo. The damage assessment was actually concluded with the efforts of the expert local and international to reflect that on the maps, the cadastral map in specific. And after almost a year, we were able for the first time to be able to see a detailed damage assessment for the three areas, one and two and three. This is an example for the damage in the area after we had completed the survey. And you can see in the center of this, where here, this is actually the Umayyad Mosque. And the closer you are here to the east, here you have the citadel. The closer you are the citadel, the more damage. Um, as I said, we were able to complete the survey in a very short period of time using actually minimal resources because of the scarcity and all the other challenges that has been actually uh, raised because of the in internal and external factors, mainly also uh, for the sanctions. When we started actually, uh, thinking and talking with the uh, different stakeholders. The first thing was uh, what to do. And we found that actually spreading hope is the first important message that we need to do. Spreading hope would require intensive, tangible actions on the ground. And training courses for the uh, stone and mason masters in Aleppo was the first thing that we have actually tried to do. And we have trained actually who is left uh, from the, those young uh, stone mates and masters who would like to pursue a career in the old city, knowing that because of the intensity of the damage in the old city, this means that they would have a sustainable uh, source of income for tens of years to come. Um, an example of uh, on the job training, picture on the right before, picture on the left, after in less than five months, those the same individuals were able to produce something like that. And then later on, we have actually uh, come up with the big question mark, where to start? What is the criteria that we should do? Uh, and for that, we have actually intensive workshops with all stakeholders. And the uh, bazaars area came as the priority number one. First, it's a World Heritage Site. Actually, the whole city of Aleppo is a World Heritage Site. Registered in Akin, it should be of a special importance because this is the backbone of the social area or the social life in, in Aleppo in general, not only in the old city. Uh, third, you are talking here about one of the oldest uh, covered bazaars in the world or the longest mall uh, in the world. Total uh, length of these different malls uh, is 14 kilometers, 36 uh, different bazaars that sells uh, different things. and. From the discussion, we come up actually with a list of criteria where we have adopted to find out which of these bazaar should be the starting point. And we end up with uh, one, which is basically have a centrally located uh, location. It actually sells, uh, you know, the useful spices, the vegetables, the meat, etc. Uh, it connects, it's actually a strategic node between north, south, east, west, and it has a less damage compared to the other bazaars, which will allow actually a faster project. Um, this is actually just, again, we started doing a damage assessment and that will show you what kind of damage that we are talking about when we started actually. Doing. Of course, using this technology in Syria in general is actually being taken part in for the first time. It's an unprecedented effort and it has resulted of this kind of detailed uh, uh, 
damage assessment that is uh, was very helpful in developing actually the concept not for the project later. Souk Sakatiya is actually the first project that we were talking about. And as we see for us, uh, we were discussing how and what kind actually of activities that we can do. This is the picture before when we started to work in uh, early 2019. And uh, as you can see, the level of damage, the debris, et cetera, et cetera. What was very important for us is actually is that the project, although it's something very important, but the most important actually is to convince people that there is hope by bringing back the integrity and the cultural identity that all the Olympians are actually very proud of. This is a very important thing for the uh, Olympians who are living in the world city. We started actually with emission in uh, 3D max, just to give an idea about what needs to be done. And we ended up after seven months with the real pictures. So this is the 3D Max. And normally 3D Max is actually something that you need to impress whoever you would like actually to present the project. So from 3D Max, we go to, this is the real picture of the Souk Sakhati, as you can see it right now. And you can see the difference between both. Of course, you can see actually the merge between whatever used to be actually a detailed planning and surveying for the uh, project. And in the result, as you can see, it took a lot of effort uh, of specialized team where we have actually helped to build the local capacity between different stakeholders, training the youngsters, especially the Olympians who are actually graduated from the university to participate in the project later on. Sustainability was actually very important just to think about what needs to be done. And as you can see, pictures speak for themselves how you can transfer the left picture when you started to the right picture. Community participation and engagement was something very important. And the Olympians known to be very proud of their national identity and local identity as Olympian, because they have actually a long historical tradition that goes back to tens of 10,000 years. And as you can see, even those who normally would not be participating in a project like that came to participate in their own Picture shows musicians coming actually paying for the workers at, at the workshops. Uh, you have actually even our admin team who is actually participating in cleaning the facade. On the picture here to the down left, uh, people who did not even wait for us to actually do the project, they started renovating their own shops, bringing it back life. But the most important thing is in the same criteria. Here, pictures for different kind of other activities taken by the community where children are actually coming to participate, where the shopkeepers are cleaning the area, where thesis, whether that's master thesis or PhD thesis about the project, where the uh, attention given by the local and national media for the speciality of this work. That has led actually to for bringing back life in a very short period of time. And what used to be an impossible mission it was done in less than a year. And picture speaks for themselves. Of course, the project itself has been reviewed by the Ekram Sharjah Committee jury, and it won uh, the first prize in 2020 for the best practices for the protection of old heritage sites uh, in using actually un, uh, unprecedented methods. We ended up, as we say, when there is a will, there is a way. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ali, for the interesting uh, presentation. I'm sure we have a lot of questions about Arifa, but the Q&A is at the end of the uh, whole session. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Ala Al-Habashi, an Egyptian, uh, Egyptian professor of architecture and heritage conservation and chairs the Department of Architecture at Minofia University. His research and practice aim to find a, a preservation framework that respects local history and traditions. He also assists in registering, managing, and evaluating sites listed as World Heritage uh, Sites. Ala will tell us uh, the story of Beit Yekan, a privately renovated 17th century house located in Derb al Nabana in historic Cairo in Egypt. It's now the headquarters of its renovators, professional practice, Turath Conservation Group, and NGO Center for Revitali Revitalization of the City. Uh, Professor Ala, you, have, you may have the floor. Shall we share the slides? Thank you, Dr. Heba, uh, for the introduction. And I would like you to please uh, share the slides as I'm not able to be on my computer at the moment. 
um, I apologize for that. So uh, the story is uh, in fact uh, of uh, a house and it's purely an, uh, a personal initiative uh, that is a bit different than uh, our colleague in Syria, which was more institutional, but uh, we were so also lucky to receive the, uh, the similar award for, for uh, uh, the 2020 uh, best practices in the Arab world, but only for uh, uh, personal initiatives. So it's, uh, it is a Beit Yakan, which is a house of Yakan, and I will let you know right, right now what is Yakan. But uh, in fact, uh, it is a, a dream that the whole neighborhood surrounding that house, that historic house, has actually adopted uh, for the entire neighborhood. Next, please. So uh, my, my lecture is, structure, is structured in three uh, venues. Uh, the first would be on uh, uh, the, the typical uh, uh, endeavors uh, as in the state, in the state of conservation. So basically, the whole city, which is inscribed as the world heritage, is managed uh, from a purely man uh, antiquarian point of view, but never really considering uh, development. Uh, and that's the usual uh, uh, endeavors in, in historic Cairo. And uh, we wanted to challenge that uh, uh, practice uh, in order to entail to adopt development in our work. The second will be on how to consider a neighborhood uh, uh, around a house. And then we will talk about a bit of the future dreams. Next, please. So uh, the usual uh, work uh, in, in historic Cairo and al Egypt is mostly adopted from the colonial time uh, uh, when conservation is being regarded as of a fabric. So this is an, uh, a project that I worked on personally, not too far from Beit Yakan. Uh, it's called Beit Razez, uh, work restored it, but still uh, uh, almost closed with no function. Uh, if you look, please next. So this is the courtyard of that house, Beta Rosez. Uh, next. That's the photograph after. Next. So basically, we were wanted to challenge that, that point where most of the projects in historic Cairo and elsewhere in Egypt uh, stop and take uh, conservation into more of venue for development, for understanding and living the history but also uh, taking the history and the traditions as means for development. Next, please. Uh, so it's not too far from Beit Razez lies other historic houses, among which Beit Yakan, which is here delineated in the bluish uh, color in the map. Uh, the left are photographs from Beit Razez as being after restoration. Uh, but uh, and, and similar to its state before restoration is are all of these has other houses uh, not uh, lucky enough to be registered in the registrar of monuments. This is the Beit Yakan when we have purchased it as a family in 2009. Those two photographs to your right. Next, please. So uh, being a conservator, an architectural conservator, we have targeted, of course, the fabric, re stabilize its uh, structural integrity, uh, uh, conserve all of its uh, values, architectural, decorative. Next, please. And those are snob, uh, snapshots of the uh, decorative elements as well as the uh, next piece as well as how these were reassembled from the rubble of the uh, collapsed sections of the house. Next. And then how to reconstitute the facade, yet not to damage the corbels, the stone corbels, which were all cracked after restoring them. We wanted to release the load. That's why we designed a series of chassis that are hanged without any dead load onto those corbels. Next, please. Here is the Baghdadli system known by Baghdadli. It's actually borrowed from Baghdad. Next. Being, being uh, ready for plastering. Next. And that's a photograph of the same uh, uh, section of the courtyard 
after restoration. Yet, we still haven't really tackled the main issue next, which is how to integrate community. And, uh, and, and here comes our initiative that started, in fact, in 2012, when we, did, when we asked the community to share with us the courtyard. The courtyard is always being used by a community member. The courtyard is always being regarded as lung of the neighborhood. So uh, it, it needs to have its own, restore its own role again into the contemporary context. And that's why we launched a series of community engagement process uh, uh, until people started to use the courtyard by their own selves and are actually managing it right now. So only the upper floors were reserved for our family. Actually, the middle floor is now being used as a public library. Next, please. So the community itself were actually quite engaged to the degree that they're seeing the process of the restoration and uh, they are hurrying up when they see elements like these in the neighborhood being demolished. And in fact, uh, unfortunately, that was demolished, the, this wonderful gate, but the remains of which were actually saved and reconstructed into the, into the courtyard as a remembrance of that uh, house that was right nearby. Next. So the second uh, the, the second exercise is actually to do to what to do with those missing elements. In fact, uh, uh, and here comes the notion of Yakan, who is the son-in-law of Muhammad Ali, uh, uh, who ruled Egypt in the 19th century, and who sent both his son-in-laws in uh, to Hegaz to fight against Wahhabis there at the time. When they came back to Cairo they, uh, and, and they did very well in Hegaz, he gave them many properties in the area, only few of which are still remaining, and they're all concentrated in what we called after Beit Yakan. After they acquired these, these properties, the whole neighborhood is called Yakaneya, and uh, that's why when we, they moved in, they tried to deface all of these Mamluk design because they were trying to promote the Turkish design of the time. So these, uh, exactly, so uh, these, all of these details were only to reveal elements of the Turkish, uh, of the Mamluk beside the Turkish uh, time. Next, please. Uh, beside that as well, we did uh, an environmental study uh, to which we we're trying to uh, reactivate the passivity of the building because of course uh, we, we lost the tradition of how to, how to use how to open and close all of these windows to allow airflow and through research that we have promoted with many of our researchers uh, in, in Egypt and in the, in the, in the university to uh, uh, come come to the recipe on how to close and, and open windows at the right time during the right day so that we can we can come closer to the comfort zone in the psychometric chart shown here. Next, please. Also, we have uh, the very first station, solar station in historic Cairo to make our building zero energy. It, it produces 12 kilowatt. And this is a message that we have announced and it was adopted by many local ministries when we heard about it. In fact, they gave us uh, uh, quite a support, financial support to implement that station. Next. We, as, as I said, we opened the courtyard for the, for the community members to enjoy that, to enjoy, uh, to enjoy it, and actually to use it also for all of, our, of their activities, among which this very nice uh, baby shower. Next. as well as we have launched the programs of getting the, uh, the, the, the students, the, the, kid, the kids and the women of the area to know better their heritage, to know the concept behind their heritage. So all of these uh, geometrical patterns that they are spread around the neighborhood are being drawn, understood by kids and by the artisans of the area so that they know the concept and they carry on the, uh, the artisans without actually uh, being forgotten. Next, please. 
The very far, last uh, notion is, uh, is to bring back the Hara, the neighborhood. And uh, th these are just uh, to position, next piece, to position where the Hara used to be within historic Cairo in an old map. So the red dot is the Hara Til Yakaniya, where all of the Yakan house uh, are located next. The Hara had its own, their own gates. All of those were actually demolished or actually left uh, without being uh, closed at night as they used to be. Because uh, when um, Napoleon Bonaparte came to Egypt in the, at the end of 19th century, at the end of 18th century, uh, the, he decided to uh, demolish all of these uh, Haras. Next, but there are a few remembers here and there. Those are photographs of the area of Yakaneya before uh, the uh, in, in the middle of the 19th century and the uh, photographs now, of course, all of those wind catchers, which were the uh, directed toward the, the northern direction, uh, the, the, pre the prevailing wind, uh, replaced now by satellite uh, dishes. Next. So we did a study on our, uh, whether to, to know uh, all of these neighborhoods are uh, totally uh, I, I have only one, two slides uh, to, to go, uh, were totally dissolved or not. So those neighborhoods apparently are still existing, but as a cultural meaning only, not as a physical uh, existence. Next. And, and, here, and each neighborhood had it still has its own characteristic. And that's why we are now working on reviving the neighborhood feeling within our community. Next, please. And the idea is to reconfigure the community, the, the neighborhood uh, or the haras into the urban fabric once more, but in a modern sense, so that it actually reflects the existing situation of all of the activities happening in the, in the, in the urban fabric. Next. And also we pro we're proposing this to uh, the, the government in order to give us a support and this project, in fact, has uh, given, given a support by the prime minister's uh, uh, office in order to be implemented. Next. Next and last, last slide, please. So basically a little nuclei is uh, like a house can be the uh, uh, initiative uh, and, and the catalyst for the urban regeneration. And, uh, and here, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ala, for the very exciting and interesting case um, in History Cairo. Um, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Yelena Stankovic. Yelena is an independent scholar currently employed as the head of fund Dr. Milan Gilic in the Ministry of Scientific and Technological Development Higher Education and Information Society in Benyaluka. Her research is primarily based on the role of the city in the memory of its uh, inhabitants. This includes uh, developing the techniques of mapping uh, collective and personal memories in order to prevent them from forgetting, but at the same time preserve the city's identity. Yelena, you may have the floor. Shall we share mm -hmm. these slides, please? Yes. Thanks, Hiba. Thanks for inviting me to be part of this webinar. So I actually met my presentation in a way to show my identity to Met. So I would just like to introduce myself as a former inhabitant of Social Federal Republic of Yugoslavia, a resident of Bosnia and Herzegovina, and a citizen of Banja Luka. So my identity is already telling you a story of uh, why uh, Yelena, uh, uh, your voice is not clear enough. Could you just really? check? Yes. Is this okay? Yeah, it's better. Thank you very much. Okay, okay so Thank you. should I start from the beginning? I'm not sure what you... Um, yes, please, yes. Okay, okay. So I actually imagined uh, my presentation in a way to show you my identity to Matt. So I would just like to quickly introduce myself as a former inhabitant of the Social Federal Republic of Yugoslavia, resident of Bosnia and Herzegovina, and a citizen 
of uh, the new book. So my identity is uh, already telling you a story of a vibrant and emerging new place where I'm coming from. So please, next slide. Next slide, please. Yeah. Um, can you hear me? Yes, it's better now. Okay. Just keep close to the uh, okay. Laptop. Okay. Thank you. So I'm from the Balkans, uh, where Bosnia and Herzegovina is geographically located. Uh, Banja Luka is the second largest city in Bosnia and Herzegovina. So next slide, please. Next slide. Okay. Um, uh, this map uh, shows Banja Luka and their different political and social regimes. So ranging from uh, the position, you can see position of Banja Luka, so ranging from the Ottoman Empire, Austro-Hungarian monarchy, the Kingdom of Yugoslavia, independent state of Croatia, Social Federal Republic of Yugoslavia, and 1995 Bosnia and Herzegovina. So next slide, please. So my question was, uh, how does a vibrant place known itself? So one of the ways the place known itself is how it's actually represented on the map, where we can see graphics on, on identity. Um, so people on maps, in order to understand the city, you need to relive and record the collective memory, preventing it from being forgotten. So next slide, please. Um, uh, for me, in order to understand the city uh, where I come from and to understand my identity, I search uh, for the maps of uh, Banja Luka. So what I find out is actually Banja Luka is not mapped in Banja Luka, but scattered across European museums and uh, libraries. So you can see the map, uh, this is a result of uh, two uh, years of my research uh, showing the countries where I actually found the maps of Yellow. So next slide. Uh, by comparing uh, a physical appearance of the city um, uh, with the paintings in the map, I found out that the paintings changes in a physical appearance that it actually um, were reflected directly in the maps. So next slide, please. Uh, so uh, this text, I'm actually trying to explain uh, to the change of street names. Um, actually, uh, all street names tell us the story of a vibrant in Europa. So next slide. So these are uh, the photos of how street uh, names were changed uh, on, on the typical buildings. So this is the typical way. Sometimes we have uh, a several uh, signs of the street, so it's a bit confusing for the people. But what is, uh, what is interesting actually that each of us remember the certain street. So next slide, please. Uh, this is the map, and this is actually uh, map displayers, how they change the street uh, names directly on the map. This is a map from uh, 1948. Uh, you can see uh, they just deleted the name and add the new one, or they just cross the old street name and add the new one. And uh, this is the map of the two um, alphabets. You can, you can find out uh, Cyrillic and Latinic. Uh, Cyrillic uh, belong, uh, belonged to uh, the Kingdom of Yugoslavia and um, Latin to Social Federal Republic of Yugoslavia. Um, next slide, please. So with all this uh, knowledge, with this knowledge and actually all that text, uh, my question was how we can record collective memory um, if we actually have maps that are scattered across the world, or we have the maps with um, layered maps with different kind of information. So, next slide, please. Uh, so, the whole process.
process of making my own memory of maps. I, I can call it uh, the learning process. So it's based on theory of collect memory. I don't have a lot of time here to talk about theory, but I will refer to Morris Hoba. And uh, the second thing, it's actually I'm collecting the collected memory of Nyaluka um, that are recorded in the form of photos, text, names, which is specifically street names, and I'm trying to integrate it into the map in order to uh, read the collected memory to the map. So next slide, please. Uh, this is uh, just one uh, point of Maurice Holbach. It's actually um, uh, trying to, uh, to uh, explain autobiographical individual memory slash collective memory that we are actually in, in reality, we are never alone because we share it with us and in us are numerous different people. Um, the actual individual memory merge with collective. Uh, we think and remember as a member of the group. We are the active participants. Uh, we are recalled to others, even individual memories mediated and social construct. So we actually recall the city by situating ourselves within the viewpoint of one of ever social group. Next slide, please. So uh, I will the process of making memory map, uh, just one building. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, this is the typical uh, one uh, building. It's called a Titanic. Um, it was built in uh, 1952 53, and it's never uh, recorded on the map. Uh, the reason for that was that the building uh, was destroyed dur during the earthquake 1959. And it was existed uh, between uh, two map recordings. So uh, map recordings were 1948 uh, and 1977. So this building is actually erased from the map. Uh, there is only just, um, uh, they just uh, subsequently, subsequently and edit, uh, edited it by red pen uh, in the map from 1984. So next slide. So uh, in order to, to, to try to find the place uh, of uh, this building, I read uh, a lot uh, about uh, this building through the text. Um, I was searching for the photographs. Also, uh, the main street where this building was located actually changed its na street, uh, the street name or almost five or six. Time. So it was really important to address uh, text, photos, and street names to specific period uh, because it meant uh, if you don't know a lot about that period, it's really hard to record that memory. So next slide. Uh, so uh, this is my memory map of Daniel Luca that no longer exists. Next slide, please. Next slide. And this is the position of Titanic. Uh, next slide, please. So I was trying to, uh, to try to find uh, how a uh, place changed during the time. And I just find out uh, three different photos from these different periods. It's actually the same angle of observation. But uh, uh, it is trying to realize uh, how we can record memory to the to the different periods. So next slide. Um, uh, putting all these uh, different collect memories over time and trying to record them, I just realized that the most important actually element. Next slide, please. Next slide. It's actually point of the view. Um, uh, you, it's actually we have the same angle of, of, of observation. Um, uh, you and me uh, are actually uh, uh, have same uh, angle of, of observation, but uh, my memory are, my, are mine, your memory are yours, but they are always, always different. So next slide, please. 
and then we refer to, to Morris from the beginning, even the city that we remember is mediated by received knowledge and memories and imagination of others. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Yelena, for the um, interesting case. Um, our next speaker is uh, William Roger Acosta Villanueva from KO University School of Media and Governance in collaboration with uh, Hiroto Kobayashi and Shigura Ban Laboratory. Roger will present a case study from Miyazaki in Japan. This case will highlight the meaning of heritage place that is connected to the use of traditional techniques. The town is famous for its traditional architectural typology and traditional methods for conservation and storing of food. But due to the use of new technology, these vernacular systems were abandoned and currently in poor conditions. Roger, you may have the floor. Thank you very much. Mm, yeah, uh, thanks so much. Uh, I'm Roger Acosta. I'm a Peruvian architect um, from K University. And my uh, project is called uh, Traditional Architecture Development, the Ishikura Architectural System that I actually did in Takachiho, Miyazaki, Japan. Uh, I would like to explain a little bit about the location and context first. Uh, I mean, Japan, as you know, is uh, is conformed by five, uh, five main islands and also nearly uh, 6,000 uh, small uh, inhabited ones. You know? And the main feature of uh, the southern part is the uh, is, uh, tropical part of Japan. Uh, here's located the uh, Kyushu Island, where the project is located in Miyazaki. So in Kyushu Island, uh, it exists the, the Aso Volcano which actually creates a sort of environment here in this, uh, in this place, right? The, it creates a sort of uh, corridors that goes from the volcano uh, through the towns until the ocean. So in one of these towns is located uh, Takachiho Shibayama, where actually this special context uh, develops some uh, a sort of uh, special dynamics related to the land use. So uh, due this, uh, all these places are uh, related to agriculture. And Takachi Hoshibayama is considered as a global important agricultural uh, heritage site uh, with also their uh, main economic activities related to agriculture, tourism, uh, gastronomy, and religion. Uh, in this place, uh, they have a particular uh, architecture. I mean, Japan is well known because of the use of the, of the wood, right? So the main traditional architecture in Japan uh, is made by the roof the, made of leaves, uh, walls made by uh, wood. And, but uh, due to these special conditions, they are sort of... Uh, buildings made by a stone because in in this area i mean there's a lot of uh quarries because of the volcano so the typical farming house agrupation uh, includes uh, kominka which is the traditional house the ishikura which is the study case which um, is made at, it definitely it means basically a stone warehouse ishikura and the agricultural platforms and uh, uh temples so I would like to explain uh, what is an Ishikura, right? But Ishikura is a small annex building in the housing settlement, which particularly is made by volcanic stone. So this uh, weird case uh, promotes uh, the correct conservation uh, for the surplus of the harvest season because they are in agricultural context. So you can put all the, the, this surplus from the harvest here to create a sort of uh, conservation, right? In good conditions. So uh, this small building 
also shares a sort of uh, cons a special constructive system that you can find actually in the in the development of the agricultural platforms that shares techniques and tools and, and, and the same also approach uh, about the food and conservation. So uh, these are the current conditions of these uh, small buildings. I mean, regarding the size of the importance of, of these buildings, uh, are quite a special, were quite a special in the past, but now are a kind of uh, people, they, they lost the, this tradition, like to, to use them as a, as a, course, as a conservation uh, building no? uh, for food. So in these days, they use it as a, a standard uh, storage. Mm -hmm. They put just furniture or whatever. Uh, uh, in general, they are in, in, in really poor conditions. So uh, this is a little bit the meaning in the past uh, about these buildings. For example, uh, from the early Meiji period, uh, the use uh, of this uh, material, you know, also in the scale of the valley, you know, they have an important meaning uh, uh, through the economy and agriculture. I mean, to, to create like a, a sort of uh, culture of prevention and landslide mitigation, you know, and do the, do the weather, right, in, in these special conditions. So they have a sort of understanding of the material, of the, uh, and, the and the use and the correct use of this uh, sustainable conditions and an environmental balance. Uh, nowadays, uh, I mean, in the year 2017, I think, no, 2011, uh, the most experienced uh, people in, in this place, they were promoting a sort of, uh, I don't know, a, a sort of a change like, of mindset. Uh, they, they were promoting uh, how to restore this small or how to reuse uh, these small buildings, uh, incentivating all the, the community just to be part of the, of the, of the, of the project. Uh, so they move a complete uh, Ishikura to a special place where they can just uh, uh, revitalize the, the value of the, of the Ishikura. And right now, on these days, uh, they are using this uh, space, uh, of course, a, a renovated building, uh, as a sort of uh, a space where uh, children then they can come to play. Uh, they can have a sort of a small concerts and expression. They can use it as a classroom also, or as well as just a, a, gather, a gathering uh, space, right? And sort of in the frame of, uh, educational uh, you know, with the community. So as a future scenario, I would like to go back to the first image. Uh, how to understand this volcanic corridor and the potential of these small buildings, uh, you know, in, in the scale of the architecture and also in the scale of the island, you know? uh, as well as uh, the community, they, they use this small building for the culture and gathering. You can find these uh, small uh, buildings through this corridor. So in, in, in somehow you can redevelop a sense of uh, territory, right, in, in this area, which would be kind of interesting for the future of the of Takachiho Shibayama. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Roger, for the interesting case uh, in Japan. Uh, it is really interesting to know about the traditional vernacular architecture and uh, what is the reaction of the local community. Uh, 
Uh, our next topic uh, is um, mapping heritage, sense of place, and collective memories, delivered by uh, Professor Nye Finneran and Dr. Christina Welch from the University of Winchester Department of Archaeology, Anthropology, and Geography. Both speakers uh, will present an exciting project that had developed digital tools to map out heritage, meaning, and sense of place. It also provides a platform that enables local and indigenous communities to define the values and meanings of what they uh, of what they identify as their own heritage. Uh, Niall, uh, you may have the floor. Can we share the slides, please? Thank, thank you, Heba, and thank you for the invite. Um, and I should say at the outset, my, my colleague, Dr. Welsh, isn't here to present. She, uh, she's unwell, but Heba's name should also be up here as well, too. Um, who, she helped us greatly with the initial design of the website and the first project that I'm going to talk to you about. And, and what I'm going to talk to you about is the development and realisation of a interactive, participatory um, digital website that um, we can use in a variety of community settings. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to talk to you about how we came up with the idea of this uh, website and then how we moved away from the East End of London and used it and tested it and proved it in the context of the Caribbean in St Vincent the Grenadines amongst uh, a very small community of indigenous Caribbean peoples. So this brings in issues around memory, community heritage, indigenous land rights and indigenous politics in the Caribbean too. Um, you, you can't separate heritage from the wider social system. Heritage has a very important role to play in society and in bettering people's lives. So that's our, our kind of starting point. So if we could have the next slide, please. This is our background. There's, there's basically two phases to what I'll be describing to you. The first is um, a higher education innovation fund uh, project, which we called Sensing Place, which started out as a, uh, an educational initiative around heritage. The East End of London is an incredibly diverse area. Um, we're particularly focusing in on um, children working, ch children in the Bengali um, and Somali communities there and understanding through a series of creative practices and photographic practices how they understood their heritage and their world around them. So very much a placemaking exercise. And we had an exhibition in 2018 at the East London Mosque which celebrated a lot of these children's um, efforts there and it was wonderful to see. Um, very, very interesting. And we're still, even now, sort of three years on, we're still working through the implications of some of this data. There's a lot of really potentially interesting stuff there, but also a, a concept as well that I introduce here called psychogeography that I'll come back to in a second. The second phase is, is working amongst the Garifuna Heritage Foundation in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And this is focusing in on a village, basically, and we're, we're, we're trying to understand issues around identity and what it means to be Garifuna. Um, and we've, we've used the website there to help the village tackle issues around memory. So it feeds into very much what Yelena was saying um, earlier about Banya Luka. Um, here, again, we're dealing with intangible heritage. We're not dealing so much with tangible heritage, but it's the intangible memories, ideas, cuisines and feelings as well. Could I have the next slide, please? So. What is, what's the Sensing Place website? Well, we, we developed this website around the project that we were doing in East London, which was basically allowing people to capture through photography and then uploading um, pictures of sites that meant something to them. And what we did as well was we put a, a small text box, which was a Twitter-sized box, essentially, so 200, 200 words, which allowed you not to describe what the site was, but what the site meant to you and the emotions and the feelings around the site. So you upload a photograph, you provide some basic demographic information and you put a description of the feelings there. This isn't a new approach. I mean, this is, this is, re this is reinventing the wheel. I mean, my, the model that I've used is with a group that I've worked with closely in the UK called Citizen, the um, Coastal and Intertidal Zone Archaeology Network, which is a a maritime archaeology network that uses a tool like this to enable people to sort of walk around. You know, you can walk around with your, your, your phone here. You, you, you take a photo, then you upload straight 
through the, the the website and we can do this 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 has a mobile platform too but as we develop this there's another sort of idea and again just to touch on some theory that informs our work which is what we call psychogeography back in the 1950s a french philosopher by the name of guy de bois a social activist who was a member of the situationist um, a group of, of sort of artists and activists, and they they tapping into sort of Dadaism and surrealism in the sort of pre Second World War sort of mindsets. And what they wanted to do was reclaim their streets and reclaim the urban um, heritage around them. And it was the whole idea of walking, rifting, and engaging with space around you. And we wondered how one could capture psychogeographic drift. And psychogeography is a very very um, Scottish. And we've got we've got a microphone. Sure. Um, psychogeography is is basically a um, uh, something that's been tapped into extensively in recent literature, particularly by writers such as Ian Sinclair, and it records things like mundane heritage and dystopic heritage, heritage that is not usually thought of as heritage, very personal heritage, upsetting heritage, traumatic heritage, heritage of decay, heritage of ruins, and so forth. And this is what we sought to do. So we have a map here. That this is the website. There's the link to it. Um, and it, you can see that we've got um, a couple of sites there. There's a couple in North Africa that Heber's dropped in. Mostly the ones up there in London are the ones that derive from our main project. Can I have the next slide, please? And this is basically what it looks like. You, you, each, each picture is numbered and mapped into a locality. Can I, next slide, please. And as you zoom in, you click on the link and it gives you a photograph. And this is a... This is a, a, a railway bridge in East London. It's one of a typology of railway bridges that's representative of industrial heritage in the East End of London. And the guy who took these photos, we, we understand from looking at his photos and understanding the way he moved through space that he was very into industrial heritage. We could see this from his descriptions. We did another study um, with, with older people as well, a sort of core of about 15 people. And one of them was interesting because one of the women that we mapped, um, the pictures were not of buildings or bridges or statues. Her heritage, her memories were in the, the uh, benches in parks and things like that. And we, we couldn't understand why she was recording benches and places in parks and things like that. But as we read her descriptions, it became clear she was she was giving materiality to the memories of where she used to breastfeed her child. Her, her, her son was two years old at the time. And so she's recalling that's a very personal heritage. Next slide, please. So this is, this is the sort of information that we can record here. So it has, it's, it's got a lot of potential to be a very useful tool to enable people to upload photographs, upload memories. And we've got it to the stage now where it can be used in a series of settings. And we've, we've shifted over now to the work I'm doing in the Caribbean amongst indigenous peoples and indigenous people's heritage on St. Vincent. Um, next slide, please. So, so the Garifuna people, the Garifuna, just to give you a little bit of a historical context, they are, their ethnogenesis is found in the intermarriage, if you like, for want of a better verb, um, of indigenous Kalinago people on the southeastern Windward Islands and runaway enslaved African people. So they're a very distinctive mixture. In the late 18th century, they fought with the British um, when the British conquered the, the Southeast Windwards and they were removed, a large number of Garifuna were removed into Roatan, Honduras in, in Mesoamerica, where they've subsequently become another diaspora within a diaspora. So you have an African diaspora and a secondary diaspora. And one of the issues around the, the Garifuna is that they're placed in St. Vincent historically, that the people who've, who were left on St. Vincent is that they've always had a struggle to get their voices heard more widely. So what we did was we took our Sensing Place toolkit, and I've, I've used this um, last year, for example, in a, a webinar that I did um, with the heads of 26 Caribbean tourist organisations to understand how you can recognise heritage assets in your community and how you can record them and upload them. So we're using this um, tool, this, 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 this GIS database, to enable people to upload photographs and to quantify what they think is valuable from a heritage point of view in their village. And we, we did a series of workshops and outreach workshops, um, particularly in schools. Next, next slide, please. And also amongst all of the teachers, all the history teachers in St. Vincent were told to come along to a workshop that we did in 2019. And there we were able to talk them through how the website worked and the tools that we've uploaded on the website that you can use to form heritage asset recognition. 
Next slide, please. And, and this all culminated in, in getting the Garifuna people living in Greg's village to think about what their heritage was and how they could package it and how they could kind of promote and sell it. And this is at the National Heroes Day event in March 2019 in St. Vincent. What we'd done with the Garifuna people was to get them to move beyond the idea of heritage as being their huts and being uh, their pottery and so forth into thinking about attachment to landscape and attachment to place and talking them through um talking them through in these events and these workshops we got them to develop this sort of kind of ideas of developing nature trails around the landscape places that are associated with ancestral deities for example but also the the memory of their wars for survival against the british in the 18th century too so it's it brings it all together. And, and one of the things that we really focused in on was cuisine. Next slide, please. Um, and this is, this is what we've got, basically a celebration, essentially, of intangible heritage through ethnobotany. We've been doing a lot of work on the ethnobotany and the food sources of the Garifuna people, recipes and things like that. And we're showing them how we, we, we can upload photographs of food, for example, and descriptions of food onto the website. And as we expand Sensing Place, we can go more multimedia. We can go with sound files, we can go with video files. Um, there's written material in there that allows you to undertake community heritage projects and identify assets as well. Um, so that's really all I've got to say. There are two contrasting case studies using basically a very, very simple digital database that cost approximately 20,000 pounds to set up but I think could probably be done um, cost effectively and, 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 and more cheaply. And it's a model that can be scalable and rolled out globally. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nain, for the, the interesting uh, cases. And it's really nice to hear how a tool that was developed in London had been used in another uh, context. Uh, our last speakers for today are uh, Miguel Vidal and uh, Pamela Duran from the China Kanda, the International Forum for Extreme Cultural Landscapes Development Program. Their presentation will be about identity and intervention in African cultural landscape in Dugan's country in Mali. The famous mud architecture settlements that are facing various cause, causes of change that had led to be abandoned. Miguel will highlight various activities along with uh, Pamela and action that had been taken in response to that. Um, Pamela and Miguel, uh, and Miguel, can we share the, um, yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good day and thank you for the opportunity to present a bit of the work that we have been doing in Mali. I will not introduce myself because uh, Hiva has already uh, done that uh, very kindly. Thank you very much. And as our time is limited, I will go straight to the point. Uh, can we please go to the next slide? Our project is located in Sub-Saharan West Africa, concretely in the Dogon country in, in Mali. I am talking about Bandiagara Cliff, a geological fault of sandstone that rises 500 meters and, and has a length of 150 kilometers. And one of the wonders is that when overflying the area, you could see nothing but a fissure or, or a crack. But when standing on the uh, lower sandy flats of the south, it is possible to appreciate the archaeological and ethnological structures and search it in the site for 5,000 years. Houses, granaries, altars, caves, tunnels, graves, sanctuaries. Some homes can only be reached by climbing or upsiling, hanging from um, ropes made out of baobab fibers. And what made the Dogons choose this cliff to build their homes? A story as old as humankind, religious pers persecution. In the 15th century, Islam was being spread throughout um, West Africa, but the Dogons have always been animistic people. Everything is alive for them. Animals, plants, but also rocks, rivers, handicrafts, even words have a soul. Hence, adopting a monotheistic belief is unthinkable for them. So they fled and precisely the inaccessibility of the cliff is what gave them the shelter they needed to hide. 
When the tokens arrived to the site, they realized that they were not the first ones to, to have the idea of living in this uh, escarpment. There were barns and caves built and inhabited since uh, 3000 BC by whom they called Bertman, actually a primitive uh, tribe called the Teyam, who used to live there until the agricultural habits of the Dogons expelled them from the territory and erased them from the annals of history. To understand the settlements uh, around the site, we should take a look at the hydrological system that favors the crops. Uh, the upper part of the cliff is irrigated by Niger River, which overflows during the rainy season and flows through the fissures of the, of the cliff, forming waterfalls as the one we can see there in the picture. And this waterfalls have been the determining factor for the location of the villages along the escarpment. The water, the water also infiltrates um, into the rock and is stored in underground reservoirs. Now, agriculture is a traditionally task for men, so men usually carry their hoe with them. Thus, when a man dies, his hoe is broken in the funer funerary rite. And water harvesting is, on the other hand, a traditional female task. And when a woman dies, her clay pitcher is broken in the funerary rite. Can we just click on the slide for a moment, please, so we can see? Uh, uh, thank you. The French anthropologist Marcel Griol lived 10 years among the Dogons and documented their cosmogony and customs and his wonderful book, God of Water, written from interviews with the hunter Ogotemeli, who had lost his eyesight in a hunting accident. And the building you see on the right is Ogotemeli's house. When Griol died many years later in Paris, the Dogons made a funerary rite in his honor and broke his pencil. Regarding anthropogenic interventions, the hydrological network of Pandiagara cliffs allows the, the Dogons not only to irrigate the few fertile fields that exist, but also to model the clay in order to continue modifying their territory. When Pandiagara was declared a cultural and natural heritage by UNESCO in 1981, uh, 1989, sorry, they expected to increase the tourist flow and the economic development of the site. Gina Kanda started working in Mali in this context, studying the site, developing local capacities through education, mapping tangible and intangible assets of the Dogons, tracing cultural itineraries, making landscape intervention projects, disrupting the minimum while sharing the maximum, because we were worried that the exchange between locals and visitors would undermine an already fragile cultural landscape. However, the coup in Mali in um, 2012 and the sudden presence of Al-Qaeda interrupted the projects and drove not only the tourists, but also researchers away, including Gina Kanda, unfortunately. Miguel will present some of the projects of Gina Kanda that have preserved and changed the meanings of this magnificent cultural landscape and also the way forward for Gina Kanda in Mali. Miguel, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you very much for this very nice explanation about uh, uh, the own country. <clears throat> the first, I'd like to introduce uh, Gina Kanda. Gina Kanda, the name is International Forum for Development of the Strength, uh, of the strength Landscape. is a society of the Polytechnic University of Catalonia. The object is to investigate and promote research on holistic identity for insertion in the planning and link with governance. What does it mean holistic identity? Holistic identity for us in a place of territory is the set of the identity and the associated with the meta landscape integrated by their intangibles. This is the, the main, tangent, uh, main uh, target of the works that develop uh, Gina Kanda. The, the first project uh, in uh, Bandiagara Cliff, in the project Ogotomeli, was to construct the uh, cartography. This is a very important problem because usually in different countries, in ways of development, it is not possible to found a cartography. And uh, we work uh, at three levels, territorial scale, 
that uh, Pamela explained the relation of the water with the situation of the village. A middle scale, you try to interpret and know the structure of the village. And finally, you work a architectural uh, landscape scale. The next, please. Uh, one question that is very important is establish itineraries that allow the meeting between the guest, visitor, tourist, and the host, respecting their privacy. The design of their itineraries refers to a different fundamental concepts for the community. Water, shadow, or reveal work key piece of idiosyncrasy and mystic belief of the Dogon. The next, the next, please, the next slide. Okay. The, the approach to the site is asset in the a map in the strategic place of the previous itinerary, uh, three values. The architectural interest, the landscape values, and the vocation of use of the following establishes in the protocols. The students has different protocols and to visit the site and use a app designed for us that allow to situate elements with these categories in the site. Okay, you, uh, the next, oh, you put the next, okay, and the next. Okay, uh, I need to stop and uh, start with the next a slide because in the, his slide has a has a lot of information. Okay. The next. No, the next, the next. <laughs> stop, please stop. Stop. Come back to the the view of the general slides. Okay. You understand me? Um, um, okay. It's necessary that you come back to other. Stop, 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 please stop. It's necessary that you, you come back to the 10 slides. Yeah, can we keep just clicking to go to the next slide, right, Miguel? But this has a, has a lot of, a lot of, many many okay we're gonna just keep clicking until we reach the next slide this one right yes but Perfect. you need to see in the screen all slides the 10 slides in the in the screen that is you oh, okay can we see all the slides please not the presenter view no no the, the 10 the 10 slides in the in the screen the 10 Yes. Can we go out of the uh, presenter view, please? Guys. Okay. Okay. It's okay. 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 When the, the document is, is constructed, is used a basis to expose the community conflicts, weakness, and potentialities. Always respecting the motto of Gina Kanda that uh, Professor Pamela advanced, these are the minimum I share the maximum. For Gina Kanda, the relation uh, with the sites and the people who live in the sites, it's, it's very, 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 very important. Very important. Uh, you are worried about the intimacy, uh, you are worried about the uh, found, the first way to, to connect with the people of, of, of the site, no? And uh, finally, you construct uh, this map, this map, and you make a, a discussion with the community of the, of the site. In the Ende, for example, has a, a community, and in the Toguna, is a special space for uh, Dogons, make a discussion about what is the best way, the thing that is better to develop. And you pay attention to this image, you see this well of color because you try to introduce uh, interventions that give a structure for, um, for 
more easy to services and communities, uh, things that is behavior uh, that is shared. This is a, this is a, this is a one part very important uh, of the work of uh, of the of the Gina Kanda. The, the next, the next. Okay, for, for Gina Kanda, the, the education, uh, the promotion of the local people is very important. It's very important for the reason uh, we work uh, uh, together with uh, architectural school of, uh, of Bamako and in Barcelona, the students uh, from Mali and the students uh, from Barcelona work together in different uh, workshops, uh, specialization course. For me, it's very important to show you this map because the question is the background of the students from Mali and the students from Barcelona is uh, dif different. I need to look for a ways of the expression that two groups uh, can work uh, together. This is not a, this is not academic drawing. Is is a, a names, lines, objects, models, etc. And this is more more academical expression. No? Uh, the, the, the next, the next, the next. The, okay. Uh, Gina Kanda and Project Ogotomeli work in, in, in Mali. Uh, in Mali, uh, you make a, a course, a theoretical course, construction, cartography, analysis, and interpretation, interpretation des intangibles dans le, pays, dans le pays, landscape, cultural landscape and mapping. Uh, the idea was introduced the students from Mali, a basic ideas about analysis of the landscape, uh, promotion of landscape, etc., etc., etc. No? This is a, a picture the students work in, in, in Ende, and uh, they work in Ende and send to Barcelona the materials in the on, online. No? The, the, the workshop was half inside, a half uh, all online. The, the next, the next, please. Mm. Uh, the, the next, please. Okay, no. Uh, okay, this is all that to change. Okay. Uh, one characteristic of the Ginacanda and the Ogotomeli project is the introduction of, of the art. No? The Ogotomeli has four characteristics. Dress in basic cartography for information, mapping, and geolocalization of the information, learning, teaching methods, and forcing artistic creation, incorporating research in land management. This is important because you think that the best way for express for express the intangible is use the art, the artistic creation, together students from Europe and from Africa. This is an interpretation of the Dogon country, the water, the elix. Elix is very important in the religion of the Dogons, life, etc., etc. And this is a model uh, designed by students that is interpret interpretation of the good water. This is a very important book for the for the Dogons and the students to try to construct a model that suggests the ideas uh, the ideas of the of the book or the other book. No? Uh, the next, the next, the next. Ne uh, come back, come back, come back. This order, come back, come back. Okay. Uh, for. Um, for Gina Kanda, also for Ogotomeli project, uh, is important to work in the site, to work in the site. The Bontuagua project, I made the construction of the small rural hotel to favor the overnight stay of visitors to, the, to Nyongono, the Adogon enclave located outside of the cliff. 
Following the starter motto, prior, prior the architectural project collected in the book Architecture Dogon Construction in Bern, the professor Wogan Lauber, a meticulous study of the place was carried out analyzing and mapping the three neighborhoods, Nyongono, Nyantaga, Endori, and Tango. Okay. Uh, this is a, a project. Unfortunately, this project is finished outside, but inside is not possible because the, the, cha the political change, uh, military situation in uh, Pais Dogon stop, stop the, this, this project. No? Here you can say the student, the, the, the world development with the students analyze the landmarks, uh, the character of the spaces, the situation of the more important buildings, etc., etc., etc. No, this is a, and probably is the last action of the the project. No, but before you make different levels, you introduce the student and use different tools that is necessary for develop the landscape, um, uh, etc., etc. No. Uh, Professor uh, Miguel, um, I'm afraid that we are running out of time. Uh, no, the last slide. Is, is yes, you. could you please wrap it up because we are running out of time. Thank you. Sorry for that. Come back. Come back. No, stop here. No, no, they're not there. They're not there. Here, stop here. Uh, what is the future? The situation is, is very complicated. And uh, you, you, um, Gina Kanda has uh, an objective is adaptation of the material from analogical to digital supports and use the textbook, the digital uh, dialectics. If you are able to pass the analogical uh, information documents, you are able to create a course online that introduce different peoples and uh, understand, design it, and create a new landscape. Uh, I think this is a situation, this is a, to think, of, think uh, when the pandemic is ended is, is our idea. No? Thanks for your attention. Thank you. I'm sorry. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Miguel. And uh, sorry again, but uh, we're going to be cut soon uh, because it's only 90 minutes. Thank you very much for the interesting word, uh, work, Miguel and Pamela in Mali. It's very interesting to hear about that. I'm going to hand over to uh, uh, my co moderator, Dr. Christopher Young. Thank you all very much for a very interesting series of presentations. Um, and to the organizers, for facilitating all this. Um, we haven't got any time for discussion now, but I think we're all going to go away with a lot of things to think about because we've seen not just some very good work that's been carried out, but we've also seen demonstrated methodology that could be used on other sites and other places around the world to sort out the meaning of sites what they mean to local communities in particular, as opposed necessarily to their world heritage definition where they are world heritage sites and how that can be recorded and then used in management of the sites. Um, one of the issues behind all this is how world heritage sites can be more holistic in their approach to the total value of the site as opposed to necessarily just the parts that are recognized as outstanding universal value. Um, and this sort of technique that we've seen this morning shows how, it shows how the, we can find out more about what people think about the places they live in, how they relate to them, as opposed to what we as academics and heritage managers think about them. And it's going to be very important to build that into future management of World Heritage Sites and indeed of all sites, I think. So thank you very much for this very interesting perspective for me, um, which I found I, I've, I've a lot to think about as a result of it. 
And just to mention that the next session in this month's presentations is the day after tomorrow at the same time as today. And we'll be looking at inno innovative models for inclusion of interpretation it, for inclusive, sorry, I, I can't read my handwriting, innovative models for inclusive interpretation of cultural heritage, um, which should build on what we've heard today about how you get the basic material you need to interpret the whole values of the site and the different aspects of interest. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much for all the, our speakers for your time today. Thank you for all the people who joined us uh, today. We apologize, no more time to have a Q&A, but feel free to post your questions. Now we are in a new digital age. We have the social media, we have YouTube, we can have the whole uh, presentations of today on YouTube. So feel free to post all your questions and uh, we're going to try our best to um, answer all these questions and our presenters will be around. Thank you very much and uh, hopefully see you in the next session. Have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you.